Uh, the question of radical democracy, as you heard probably in the beginning of the day today, um, we are still debating what radical democracy is and what is radical about radical democracy. So we have invited um, uh, the chairs, um, the keynote speaker, and our two founders of this event, uh, Stathis Gurguris and Andreas Kalivas, um, to speak to us on the issue of radical democracy and hopefully debate politely on their different um, conceptualizations of radical democracy. So um, I guess the order that will go in will be um, Professor, <laughs> Professor Tabak first, Professor Connolly second, um, Professor Poole um, third, Andreas fourth, and Statis last. Each of them has 10 minutes. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm going to propose some ideas here that will probably sound a little dogmatic uh, because I'm going to try to put them in terms of demands in some sense without giving a lot of um, philosophical background to where they come from or even political, we can perhaps have that uh, during the discussion. Um, I just want to get across some ideas I have in my head, and then maybe if you're interested, later on you can buy me a cup of coffee, supply me with some cigarettes, we can sit down somewhere and talk <laughs> for several days. <laughs> okay, so I want to start with the question of radicalism and what I understand by the word. And here, surprise, surprise, I use Karl Marx's definition mm -hmm. of radicalism. Um, just like the number root, uh, Karl Marx speaks of radicalism as the attempt to go and consider the real root of circumstances in situations. And he adds that, and forgive the gendered expression here, man is the root of everything. So here we have the concept of man, or human nature, what I would like to call human essence to distinguish it a little bit from um, as the beginning, as the standpoint, as the yardstick, so to speak, with which we can understand the circumstances and with which we can uh, propose results. Of course, the big question is how did you come up with this theory, in a sense, and I can't really go into it too much, but um, if you're interested, I can direct you reading Marx a little bit. That's uh, self service there. So I understand by that when man is the root and going radicalism goes to the root of some kind of a problem in which man finds mankind, human humanity finds itself. So a lot of skipping a lot of steps here, the view I subscribe to, and again it's influenced by Marx, is that there is a contradiction between human essence and existence in capitalism. You can call this alienation or other familiar concepts if you want to think about them with where I come from or what I have in mind. And I would like to again in a uh, caricaturized manner say that uh, existence, there are other aspects to it, but I find this to be very fundamental and, and crucial, um, social relations and forces of production. And with forces of production, I include conditions of production as including also nature. So in some sense, and one of the key, and I think this comes from Hegel, one of the key um, dynamics of Hegel, Marx's dialectic is the relationship <coughs> which repeats often enough between man and nature. So in nature, the way we have constructed it, which includes social relations, and the actual objects of nature and forces of production, the nature we use for the productive purposes, uh, we find ourselves uh, in the circumstances which we have created in an alienated situation, which then calls for a project of emancipation. So for me, radicalism is about the emancipation of human beings. And in this context, since we have to uh, as I stated, it's indeterminate. We have to put it into a more particularized context in the context of capitalism. 
So we have to, what I mean by radicalism is emancipation from the social relations and even the forces of production uh, in capitalism. So again, jumping out of necessary steps here, if this were three, four hour presentation, we'll go into them, but uh, um, I then equate, emancip uh, I think that emancipation of this kind, again, I'm not reducing everything to this, but I find this to be a fundamental importance, since we do live in capitalism, requires reclaiming the forces of production, not as hostile forces as they have become, and you can think of capital. So therefore, we're not dominated by the capitalists alone, but the inherent force within capitalism to accumulate that governs our lives. So in some sense, in the circumstances that I have in mind I'm talking about in capitalism, um, we are governed by necessity, by the realm of necessity uh, over which we have no control. So the project that I'm thinking about, the emancipatory project, uh, is not reduced to outdoing the capitalists, but it also has to do with reclaiming the forces of production, which includes nature. And by reclaiming, I mean that these things that I have just mentioned should be used for the purposes of human emancipation. So therefore, this establishes a principle on which what I will be calling in a second socialist democracy has to be organized around. So emancipation with a view of alienation in existence pertaining to forces of production and relation of production. <coughs> now, this means, if done, it's easier said than done, but this means that five minutes, I'm on 5.5, so I'm doing well, I think. Um, this means that we have to radically alter the existing society. So radicalism for me in one involves beginning a new society based on new social relations and new kind of relationship to nature as well as the forces of production. So in a sense, I'm calling for an a priori, which becomes, a, once it's established, an a priori general will that already, that is not so indeterminate as it is with Rousseau, for instance, but has the principle of human emancipation uh, as its basis. Sort of a first contract, if you will, on which the new society is to be reconstituted. So again, this means doing away with the existing society. And I am very convinced, and you can try to convince me otherwise, that radical departure from this, and even radical democracy, on which I will say a couple more things in a second, is not possible unless we reconstitute the society, get rid of the capitalist society, and build it on uh, socialistic principles. I would say communist too, but then you will ask me what do you mean? Are you talking about Stalin, Mao, so on and so forth? I don't want to go into it. Let's stay at the milder level for now. <laughs> so, in a sense, what I'm calling for is the collectivization of the means of production in part. And collectivization obviously has a uh, bad reputation nowadays because when we hear the word, we think about the Soviet Union and the collectivization processes, forced collectivization processes, uh, that ultimately led to a um, totalitarian kind of control of the forces of production. So I claim that the emancip emancipatory project I have in mind requires not only collectivization by itself, but a democratic control of the means of production. So democracy comes into play here as an, as an instrument of emancipation, not necessarily as um, an end in and of itself. Now, I don't reject the point that democracy can be an end in and of itself for democracy, but I see its instrumental role here as being also crucial. So therefore, I don't have to spend time uh, convincing you that democracy is, as an end in itself uh, is justified on some kind of principle that we're talking about. Okay, so this means that 
on a two minutes, okay? Uh, on a, I'm almost done. On a model like that that I have in mind, democracy itself becomes more participatory. But not only in the sense, I'm open to idea of different kinds of models of democratic participation. Perhaps more participatory the better, we have to take into account the utility of all these things. But uh, setting those aside, but what I see here as a potentiality is the enlargement of the gamut of citizenship participation. So it has the side effect with which we, then we can say, expand the sphere of democratic participation. Uh, in fact, due to the nature of the capitalist system, the way it works, the democratic control of the means of production is largely excluded. I say largely because depending on where you and which time period you're talking about, this can vacillate a little bit. But uh, that the citizenship is excluded. Private, the, the economic reality is largely considered a private reality. And we must notice very quickly that um, a lot of the important decisions that affect our lives are economic decisions made by few individuals who are the owners of the means of production. So it is not simply that these people are trying to make profit, but what they do ultimately affects our lives. Therefore, this constitutes a legitimate reason as to why we must democratically participate in such decisions. Of course, the legitimacy of why we must collectively own this has to do with the social nature of labor. That we also believe, as a Marxist, but I'm not ashamed to admit, uh, that, um, that that the wealth, the, 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 the means, forces of production, all these things, capital, is produced by social labor, and therefore what we're doing is actually reclaiming it with this kind of model. On that note, I think Andreas is looking at me with a zero in his hand. Looks like a bonus. <laughs> uh, I will start and <laughs> So, but one more final point that. The democratic model, of course, I don't leave it open-ended democracy. So something I repeated earlier on, it must be based on the principle of human emancipation, which is abstract, and in some sense, it can be, it leaves open, because it is abstract, it leaves room for democratic contemplation. If we knew what that in, involved, and this, that if we were in control of the circumstances fully, then democratic decision would not, would not be all that required, perhaps. So, <coughs> principle, grounded, socialist democracy. You can call it perhaps some kind of a, a constitutional uh, socialist democracy. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so, um, I, I will be brief, and I, I think there are uh, uh, at, at least uh, four elements that need to be incorporated into what I want to call as an interim project in democratizing are the world that we are actually in further. And since given the conception of time I have and so forth, I think it's important to think it in terms of interim possibilities. Interim possibilities. Uh, so, uh, and so in the in the conception that that uh, that uh, I've been uh, working with, uh, there there are at least four elements involved in the interim democratization, uh, and. Uh, they, they're, they're tensions between them, uh, but their interdependencies are even more fundamental. That's the way I see it. <coughs> so, uh, first, uh, the uh, democracy must come to terms more uh, actively and affirmatively with the intense pressures to minoritize the world across multiple dimensions that are in play today. Uh, so that uh, democracy and pluralism have to be joined together. In my book, I mean that. I, mean, I, I wrote a book about that. So they have to be <laughs> joined together. <coughs> pluralism is no longer a luxury, uh, if it ever was. Uh, the, the, the failure to produce and expand it has become uh, the, uh, the only way today to avoid those violences uh, that find expression in territorial walls, in ethnic cleansing, in violence against the diversities of gender and sexual practices. And, and, and I, I include linguistic pluralism. And so you need multi-dimensional pluralism is to 
my way of thinking, essential to an interim project in improving democracy in, in our age. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and this phrase of the minoritization of the world, it's built into a whole bunch of processes that we could discuss, but they're not likely to go away. So that's the first idea. Second, and related, uh, democracy has a productive rift at its center when it's operating well. And, uh, and it must uh, seek to maintain two sides, uh, and uh, these two sides and maintain or uh, negotiate a productive tension between them. Uh, so there, there is the ethos of engagement between diverse <coughs> constituencies uh, uh, through which uh, common actions can be, a positive ethos of engagement uh, can be produced, generated, uh, while diversity is maintained. And then there is second, the peri periodic politics of becoming or pluralization by which new identities and rights and faiths and demands for equalization in this or that domain uh, uh, move from a, 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 a place below the register of acknowledgement or of recognized justice or of legitimacy onto one or more of those registers. And so this, this tension back and forth, a productive democracy for me maintains that tension. And, and, uh, and this, the second side of it is one of its, uh, the, the elements of agitation that's built into uh, democratic, a democratic culture. <coughs> so it, it, it maintains a productive torsion between two interdependent processes. And it never reaches a point, even in principle, where you can leave that torsion. That's, that, uh, uh, those kinds of regulative ideals scare me. Uh, third, uh, you can't have a uh, thriving democratic society, even in an interim sense, unless it is possible for uh, all sections of the populace to participate in the cultural uh, life that is made available and in the infrastructure of consumption that the state and market together make available corporate market together make available. So uh, you don't need absolute equality to achieve this, but you do need uh, democratic processes by which you uh, significantly shift the infrastructure of consumption in the, uh, the dominant infrastructure of consumption, especially in American society today, but uh, others as well, so that people can participate. And so you, you close the gap between the lowest and the highest in terms of participation in the common life, but also in terms of income levels. Uh, but you, there's no need for, what have I got to try? Uh, 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 radical uh, equalization. Uh, and I think that there are interim ways to promote such things, such events, within uh, not neoliberal capitalism, but uh, uh, capitalism more broadly defined, where you have uh, a lot of private ownership, a contractual form of labor is, is uh, dominant, and you have the uh, priority of the commodity. Uh, and I won't list those here, but I have tried to list them in chapter four of the capitalism Christianity. Fourth, uh, given the acceleration of pace and the uh, the uh, further uh, exacerbation of the global and planetary dimensions of so many aspects of life, global and planetary, uh, we must pluralize more radically the sites at which democratic action occurs. So you think of yourself sometimes as a citizen of the world, uh, and a citizen of this setting and that setting as well. Uh, so, Today, for instance, uh, we must uh, draw upon the regional and global networks of communication to multiply the, the, the number of uh, episodic cross-state <coughs> citizen 
movements and campaigns. Uh, and they'll be episodic. And, uh, those, that's, that's semblance or aspect of democracy waxes and wanes. But um, uh, we have to rethink our very notions of citizenship and the sites of citizenship. And then what the mode of citizenship is at each and every site. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and you know that I think that part of that, these movements are involved with the issues of climate change variety of other issues that I want to defend off drone strikes and so forth. A variety of other issues that I want to mention now. Because I think now I'm down two minutes. So four dimensions. Uh, each of them speaks to the issue of participation, but each in a somewhat different way. And they speak to what I take to be an interim uh, idea of uh, activating democracy in more uh, effective ways, uh, not to uh, a kind of a universal or final vision of what uh, democracy would have to be. Because I don't know how to think that way. I think I had a minute left. We can use it. All right, thank you. Um, I've got a question here, questions that I, I'm supposed to address, and, and I, I want to just mention some of them. Uh, the main one I think is what is radical democracy. And I fear the answer is, is disappointing. I don't know the answer to this. Um, I, and I, I'll try and explain why I don't know the answer, and I'll explain the extent to which I don't think it matters too much, uh, and the extent to which it does matter. Um, start with some of the words that we can learn from the Occupy movement. Um, at a certain point in the politics of the Occupy movement, um, a mutual friend, uh, in criticizing some aspects of this politics, uh, referred to the inappropriateness of the word Occupy, and thought it brings up the wrong connotations, military connotations, things like this. <coughs> It's not the appropriate word for the kind of politics that the um, occupied movement was entered. And I can't saw the point of that, but then I realized that um, the mistake in that was to think that words have a fixed meaning, or they're fixed by their history in some way. That in fact, since the occupied Wall Street never really occupied Wall Street, and of course it took over a part close to Wall Street. Uh, Wall Street is a metaphor for something else, not a space. Uh, the Occupy movement into, moved into things like Occupy the Debt, Occupy Hurricane Sandy, and the word Occupy is being pushed in all sorts of ways. Uh, the, the interesting thing, of course, is it's got a connection with a certain kind of politics, a, a self-managed politics, a kind of direct action, an anti-institutional politics, a, a, politi a politics that's skeptical of centralized organization, things like that. But that's about it. Okay, so the word Occupy moves. I think we need to be historicized political concepts much more than a lot of discussion does. The concept of democracy, the term democracy really gets into politics, except as a pajorative word of the 16th and 17th, 18th century, um, becomes a thought of as a serious politics sometime 18th century, 19th century. And there's certain historical conditions for that, but the, one of the major ones, of course, is the centrality of the state and the relationship between citizens to state and the dissident forces within the citizenship and things like that. Okay, out of this emerges some kind of institutional practice of democracy. Now, there's lots of, as it were, criticism to be made of this. Uh, and uh, just to, to center you know, some of the tendencies within it, was to think of politics simply in terms of the state. Another was to think of power simply in terms of the coercive power operated by the state. In other words, a simplified notion of power uh, and a simplified notion of politics. So, now essentially, Insofar as democracy has been practiced, institutionalized, 
it still bears that legacy. And of course, on the, on the left, as Maynard has reminded us, there's uh, been serious attempts to broaden the scope of democracy. Now, we, we know the old model is no longer satisfactory, but we also don't know <laughs> any one model that takes its place. What we do know is there, and we didn't need the modern world to show us this, there are many other forms of power apart from coercive power. The state operates with many more forms of power than mere the power to coerce violence. But also, there are other centers and fields of power. So if at least a part of the motivating impulse behind democracy is the idea that somehow if we are subject to forms of power, we should have some say in how they're organized. We should participate in the operation and the formation of that. We're now constructed with a whole, you know, you know, the old model of, okay, let's just take control of the state. And then if that was ever going to work, it doesn't work now. So we need to think of not a model of democracy, but different models of democracy. Obviously, in some contexts, um, you know, participatory democracy um, is appropriate <coughs> and desirable. In other contexts, uh, who's going to do something about environmental warming? Who's going to do something about uh, global inequality? All these massive problems. The kinds of democracy that are appropriate are going to be much more distance mediated. Uh, another form of power, if by moment, if we have any concept of socialism, that is collective ownership, presumably democratic ownership of the means of production, control of the means of production, we've got to think seriously, and then there's a tradition of thinking about this, of what forms that democratic control would take, the, the way off between wider social interests <coughs> and the interests of those in the productive process. Things like this. Oh, everywhere you turn, there, there are problems. Okay, does that mean we don't know anything? Well, we know something. We know the history. We know something about the ideals that are contained in the history of democracy. Um, we have some notion of the problems of institutional forms of democracy and some notion of the uh, problems in those centers of power where there's no semblance of democratic Okay, so we can call on another aspect of the tradition of democracy, the distinction between institutional democracy, the structures of democracy, and democracy as a practice. So radical democracy, I take it, has something to do with the practice of democracy. Um, and I want to say there, it's a practice, we've got a better sense. Democracy is like freedom. We've got a better sense of when we're confronted with something non-democratic, when we're confronted with unfreedom, than what democracy consists in, what freedom consists in. So the practice is one of working out the forms of democracy that are possible and available. Okay, that's the most important. I think that's mostly what I want to say, but I think. I haven't got my two-minute notice, but I do have my two-minute notice. I want to say, what we should be a bit wary about is using the word democracy as if it covered all values. It doesn't cover all values. There are other values like justice, sometimes individual freedom, the future, things like that, which ideally will be encapsulated within democracy, but can at stages be intentional. I got, I, I learned a lot and I wish I had more time to think of Bill Connolly's talk today. Um, however, I've got a sense here when he kept talking about democratic activism, with the assumption, too easy to make, that democratic institutions will always be in the service of truth. And of course, genuine democracy 
won't always track truth. A democracy like freedom, it's closely related, must be involved with freedom to make mistakes, to be wrong. So sometimes what we think is necessary is going to clash with the best democratic decisions. Um, I was going to say something more, but I don't have time. Can I just say one, one minute? This, uh, 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 this is a little bit of uh, advertising for constellations. There's a, a, a terrific um, section in the current constellations. <coughs> Andreas is my commander in chief. Um, on militant democracy, discussing the conditions under which it is possible for non democratic means to be used to sustain democratic institutions. And if there's something wrong with the articles in this issue, there's the assumption that um, non-democratic means uh, they're identifiable, you know, like uh, terrorist activity or um, previous ruling parties who are, have a history of uh, uh, authoritarianism. And things like that. But the whole fucking system is full of anti-democratic <laughs> systems, forces trying to make use, manipulate democracy, or sub subvert it when it can't manipulate it. So the problem of the threat to democracy is not something on particular occasions, it's always present. So that means, okay, what sort of form of democracy can we construct that has the means, both conceptual and political, to confront the ever-present threats? <coughs> So, I would, I would present just um, a few <coughs> fragmented thoughts about the question of radical democracy. Uh, let me start that uh, the, the term itself, radical democracy, as I uh, usually say, it's, uh, and so it's, uh, it's a repetition here, but uh, it needs to be reminded, uh, it's a pleonasm, it's a tautology. A democracy is, is either radical or it's not a democracy. In other words, the radical uh, uh, aspect that we're discussing is always already integral to the democratic experience. So what I will, uh, the few thoughts I, I will present to you, uh, it's precisely to, 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 to remind ourselves what is radical uh, in democracy in this uh, uh, endemic uh, uh, internal way. So I take uh, a democracy very minimally uh, to uh, signify the political uh, form of the poor which means uh, uh, two things. First, uh, that uh, the poor constitute the political form of their collective life. So, in the sense that uh, the first uh, truth of democracy is the constituent power, uh, exercised uh, and enacted uh, by the poor. And the second uh, dimension is that uh, this political uh, form of collective existence is uh, the self-government of the poor. The poor governing themselves. Uh, consequence of this, uh, the second, uh, let's say, uh, truth uh, or radical truth of democracy is that uh, in order to have a democracy, you need to have defeated your enemies. And the enemies of the poor are the wealthy. So in that sense, uh, if we want to expand on this uh, notion of the radical content uh, or potentiality uh, imminent uh, in the democratic experience is that the poor constitute their own forms of their collective existence that uh, excludes uh, or defeats uh, the wealthy, the rich, uh, the grandi. Now, another uh, level of, implica of implications uh, for understanding uh, uh, the radicality of democracy is that precisely because uh, it is uh, a form of constituting new political forms of self-government of the poor, it cannot be compatible and is therefore radically incompatible with the state form on the one hand and with capitalism on the other. In other words, uh, uh, democracy is not possible, is irreconcilable with the state form and the capitalist mode of production. Now, the capitalist form and the state form are the two pillars of political modernity of our times. In that sense, the, another uh, additional implication of what constitutes the radicality of democracy is that democracy is uh, radically incompatible with modernity. That means, uh, on the one hand, uh, that uh, democracy today does not exist uh, as a practice, as an experience, 
as an institutional form of government. And the second is that uh, the possible hypothetical advent of democracy will signify in that sense an, a political exit from the modern. And this uh, raises the question of uh, uh, thinking or developing a democratic critique of modernity, something that I think uh, has not been done. It is uh, characteristic uh, uh, of uh, uh, our current times, uh, not only to understand them as democratic uh, in one way or another, partially, uh, limited, uh, self-limited, uh, and direct uh, or representational, but uh, to understand the non-modern as inherently anti-democratic. So what I would like to suggest uh, is how one can rethink uh, democracy as this radical departure from the modern. The, what it might be outside uh, uh, modernity should not be understood, uh, of course, as the primitive, on the one hand, uh, because this itself, the modern versus the primitive, is a modern distinction, it's part of the modern logic. But it might be the case that today the possibility of democracy could be less probable, uh, more probable, uh, more likely, in the less, in the less uh, uh, modernized uh, regions of the, globe, of the globe, which also implies that uh, the belief or the hope to see democracy in the very center of the modern present might be just uh, a wishful thinking. Therefore, in, the, in that sense, uh, the struggle for radical democracy should happen either against uh, the spaces of modernity or outside those spaces that raise the question what might be this outside and probably at the margins uh, of the modern globality today. Uh, to go back to some of the discussions we had uh, uh, from the morning, especially with uh, relation to Europe, um, it seems to me that uh, the thought of the um, um, project of a democratic Europe is a, a, another a kind of another a wishful thinking uh, of that kind. Its only hope, if there is such a possibility, will be precisely um, a hope uh, provided by um, the migrants uh, that are, the, in a sense, uh, the new pools of uh, global neoliberalism. Uh, any discussion about uh, uh, a democratization uh, of Europe will uh, automatically uh, involve the deconstruction of the idea of a European demos and the creation of another collective identity that will be parallel or uh, symbiotic with uh, the um, uh, transformation of the collective uh, political subjectivity uh, of Europe, that is, uh, with the rule of the new poor. Now, that might seem uh, an impossibility, in, in, and in that sense, uh, uh, the most hopefully, hopeful spaces uh, is to search uh, from uh, spaces uh, that are located uh, in the periphery of the model. I take this to be the new geopolitical uh, primary sites uh, uh, of democratic struggles today. Not in the center, not uh, in the core, but uh, in, the, in, the, in the spaces where modernity arrived later and uh, uh, its effects uh, have been uh, less successful. So just uh, to conclude uh, uh, in, in, uh, very briefly this kind of uh, uh, rather um, uh, cursory and uh, um, uh, fragmented thoughts. If uh, democracy is the political uh, form of the poor, it will mean uh, that uh, the dimension, uh, an important uh, symptom or expression of democracy, uh, something that uh, I also said uh, uh, in the first conference, but I will repeat because uh, it doesn't seem to, to have any appeal, but it is part of the definition of democracy as I understand it, that uh, it needs uh, to generate fear into the rich. There is uh, no other symptomatic uh, 
manifestation of uh, democratic power, that is of the self-government of the poor, if the rich and the wealthy are not afraid. Um, if uh, the rich uh, find themselves uh, 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 in a symbiotic relationship with democracy, it means democracy does not exist. It is the test uh, of democracy itself. And the, 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 the way to um, generate such a fear, after all this is uh, uh, whatever has been uh, said uh, as criticism of democracy from Plato on, uh, up to the 19th century with Benjamin Constant, and then it stopped because then the democracy became just a, 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 a ritualistic reference than an actual practice. So in order to generate this fear, um, and I don't mean uh, in the Jacobin sense of, of terror, but uh, of uh, practical political measures, is to reconstitute uh, itself in a revolutionary empowerment of the poor, that is, of the many. So, just to conclude, uh, radical democracy is simply a project, it's not a reality, that is, democracy is not a reality, and uh, the possibility uh, of uh, its realization will mean uh, the, uh, the end uh, of the model. Uh, before I give the word to Statis, um, we'll have the discussion over wine, so, <laughs> so you don't have to... Keep your questions for the wine. Yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> so sad. Uh, I want to I just uh, take up a little bit of my time just to say that I want to thank uh, those of you that organized this and all of you for coming here. Um, when uh, Andres and I did this pedagogical experiment three years ago, um, this would have is not uh, what we had in mind, but that is precisely why uh, this is an exercise in self-governance, and that's why we cannot be called founders. <laughs> this is, has to be banned from the vocabulary. Um, and then uh, I was going to say some, similarly that in a, it's a very strange uh, way to end this uh, uh, very uh, exercise of government by having what it looks like the kind of parody of the like, Council of Elders. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, it becomes at least a parody, particularly because we're all under the command of, of, of Zero. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll find you later. So, uh, exactly. Anyway, um, I, I am going to answer all three questions that Marina sent to me, uh, obviously terribly briefly, and therefore just formally, which will raise all kinds of other questions. Uh, and there are two domains, one philosophical, which is a set, uh, the realm of speculation, and the other political, which would be understood to be the realm of action, uh, practice, or perhaps in the historical realm. So, uh, what is radical uh, about radical democracy? Again, uh, I share uh, uh, both Mehmet and Andres' points, coming going back to Marx, uh, that in fact, um, what is radical about democracy, radical is, is democracy itself. Um, and that to use the term together is a pleonasm. What does this mean? It means that it cannot be created by, but also not evaluated by, not accounted for, by another entity or framework, uh, any other entity or framework other than itself. Of course, it is being accounted for by other entities, but uh, these are always combative uh, and certainly not democratic. Um, democracy, in this sense, is not a phase uh, or in a sequence of political order. Uh, it is invented created, maybe if you want to use that word, provided that we understand the power of that word as in its artifice, which for me is a very positive notion. Uh, and in order to remain, it must be uh, uh, continuously or always intending to and actualizing a reinvention of itself, a recreation of itself. That is to say, it cannot be invented or created once and for all. Now, politically speaking, what makes a democracy radical in the way that we want to um, to say it, uh, we can give other definitions, but I'm going to give the one that's the most disturbing one. Uh, for me, what is radical politically is what would have to be the full-fledged uh, substitutability uh, of political actors. Um, that is to say, regardless of uh, the requisite personal, radical personal individual differences or social particularities, um, there has to be a total substitutability of political actors, a, a equivalence, a radical equivalence, and I use that term, not equality, you 
you'll see why, but really an equivalence of all political actors. This is essential uh, to anything radical in democracy. This is hardly to say, obviously, I hope you understand that this abolishes the personal or the radical differences of this personal and social. In some ways, on the contrary, but that's a very uh, big discussion, uh, I, uh, and we can have it afterwards, but keep in mind that liberalism seeks to want to erase this radical difference between what for Arendt was the political and the social. I don't want to be interrelated as an Arendtian, but that's the, one of the references. Liberalism wants to erase this difference uh, precisely so as to ultimately sustain, in the name of the equal opportunity in the marketplace, uh, a, uh, a silent uh, non-equivalence of political actors. Now, the second question uh, was, uh, what does a radical democracy aim at, uh, and what would be its imminent or external dangers or risks? So, what is following the obviously the first definition? What does it aim at? Well, a radical democracy can only aim at itself. It can only intend itself. It cannot have another object. Uh, to transfer, uh, if we're going to be rigorous philosophically now, philosophically speaking, I said formal definition. Okay. Um, now, um, it has to be able to account for itself in that way, and accountability is a term that was used here uh, already, and I think it's a very important term. Uh, and intention for me literally is it not intention sort of uh, knowing in advance what to do, but really tending to, tending toward, uh, literally speaking. Now, this is without any kind of uh, finality. Here, I, I share very much Bill's uh, important differentiation. Now, politically, uh, you can have many identifiable ends, right? And, in, intentions and ends. Clearly, obviously, the emancipation of specific constituencies, etc. cetera. Um, but all of those, I would argue, are temporal manifestations of this formal intention. Uh, and, and we would have to investigate each one of them historically and obviously in real concrete social historical terms. But the fact of the matter is that this kind of philosophical self-aim, uh, uh, aim at oneself, has to be retained. Because the moment we uh, make radical democracy instrumental in attaching it to some other end, uh, uh, we lose <coughs> the radical aspect. Um, now, what are the dangers? I think that the external danger is obvious. I, I don't need to talk about it. it well, in, it's basically the enemies of democracy. The supreme enemy is, of course, capitalism. I think that we've uh, been talking about this address, as we mentioned, and I don't want to go on further uh, in this way. Um, imminent dangers, internal dangers, are more difficult to, to perhaps identify because, again, they would tend to be particular. But there, is a, there would be a tendency uh, to say, again, I'm obviously simplifying, whatever diverts from or obscures uh, the commitment to this self-organization, uh, self, uh, um, um, you know, uh, self-articulation, uh, et cetera. Right? Whatever gets in the way, whatever turns democracy into procedure, whatever turns democracy into regulation, is in fact danger dangerous to its radicality. I understand the enormous problems this position would pose for real activism. I'm not, I'm not unaware of that. But it is important uh, to keep this uh, in mind, at least in the back of our minds, when we're involved in activism. <coughs> the last question, I am actually making one here, that's good. Uh, the last question is, how does radical democracy manifest itself? I, we've heard some very, I mean, I'm sorry I wasn't able to be here in the morning, but the afternoon panel uh, had some very, very interesting uh, responses to this, actually. This, the question of space of appearance is something that would uh, actually interest us a great deal in this. But if I were to formalize it again, you know, again, pardon me for obviously simplifying, lack of time. For me, radical democracy manifests itself whenever uh, a large masses of people in, a, in, in what we would call an assembly uh, comes together uh, in the public space in its sheer togetherness and, in, and despite, again, the differentiation, the heterogeneity, the particularities, these are not at all overcome or erased, but beyond them, uh, whenever it comes in public space, and it, by doing so, by just that alone, withdraws consent from power, from established power. That is the moment where radical democracy manifests itself, in that gesture of withdrawal of, of consent, which happens by sheer appearance. 
Okay, uh, and of course we understand that there's political war, and 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 that that's not enough, and there has to be also constitution power and all that. I don't want to go into it. I think the very first moment, the the first moment of autonomy is precisely that gesture of withdrawal of consent, and it has to be public, and and it has to be done in no one's name, right? Um, now, what happens to people who are not, uh, who have not, uh, uh, have con who have not consented to power? Who have, who are disenfranchised and therefore have never lent their consent to power. They should not be asked uh, to be involved. This, I think, is a very interesting question. Uh, it seems to, and we talked. That's part of the panel again in the afternoon was a lot about that. Uh, it seems to me that for those people uh, for whom whose consent was never asked for and they never gave it, for them um, the only possibility is really outward insurrection. There is no other really. Uh, you, while for those who are within the realm of citizenship, however we are going to define it, <coughs> the, the withdrawal of consent is, it can be by sheer public appearance. Okay? It doesn't happen very often. Uh, it doesn't happen very often. But you have to look at it in every revolutionary moment it's there and it's very uh, interestingly uh, presently there. I'm almost uh, to the end. Uh, the, you know, the Occupy then becomes a very interesting notion because it is about occupying the public space, the space of power. Uh, which is presumably, which is actually ha actually never entirely empty. That's another discussion. The space, the space of power, occupying the space of power. That's why this word is useful. <coughs> I just want to remind you, and I'll end with that. I think I may have mentioned this last time when we were discussing this. But the Occupy movement in Puerto Rico, its 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 uh, slogan was "Unoccupy Puerto Rico," because for them that was precisely the gesture of occupying the space of an occupied, colonially occupied space. So the word, of course, as as it was, is not. Uh, I want to thank the panelists, if you can join me in that, and you can talk to them.